about Faro and where it comes from and uh, what we plan to do. So um, I think around uh, two years ago, uh, we had a kind of a realization that we were using uh, Smalltalk every day and that was actually um, partly at uh, Bern in a research group and partly at INRIA where Stefan Ducasse is uh, working and partly actually in industry so some of uh, the people in Bern uh, did in parallel to the PhD uh, they worked in industry um, I will show actually some of the or at least one of the projects later and so we realized we were using Smalltalk every day um, but it really did not improve enough. So we were using it every day, there were problems, and nothing happened. So, yeah, as I said, research, we were using it for doing our PhD, we had master students that were using it for the master thesis. Uh, we were teaching it, which is especially funny because when you use, we use Squeak for teaching, when you use Squeak for teaching, it takes around three weeks until the best students comes to you and says, hmm, what you teach, I can't find it in the system. The system is different and if it's a really good student the student says the system is not well implemented according to what you teach to us and that's true and the question is why uh, do we have this disconnect between the code base and what we teach the students if we know how to do uh, object-oriented programming then we should actually at least try to have that uh, in the system that we teach with and the business aspect so if you use it uh, for business you want to use it uh, in a way that uh, that makes sense so the question was, why don't we continuously improve what we use? Um, we actually, for, for Squeak, we actually tried to do it. So we were involved in, uh, since a long time in the development, I think since 3.5 more actively, and 3.9 we did, mostly um, uh, from Bern as the main release coordinators. And I think it was not actually too bad what we did, but the community did not really like it. So we got almost no positive feedback at the end and people said you can do that better that's not good enough and so other people took over and we were kind of uh, standing there and thinking what do we do seemingly uh, the direction that we wanted was not the one that the rest of, of the people wanted and other thing that, that was used was actually a visual work so the uh, part of the group that was doing uh, language research was using Squeak because we can change the VM very easily the part of the group that was doing software visualization actually used VisualWorks because the data sets are huge and we need a, a good virtual machine for that. And historically it was actually done in VisualWorks. And at the same time it was clear that VisualWorks was not a solution anymore because the problem of the tool that, they, that this part of the group developed, which is called Moose, uh, was that it actually comes with the whole development environment of VisualWorks. And so there was a big problem from the license. You cannot ship that as a, uh, as a tool to the two people that want to use it. Even so it's open source, even so there was a foundation uh, behind it. It was impossible to build uh, Moose, the product for download using VisualWorks. There was no way. There was no way to buy a license. There was no way to do it. And so the question is, what do we do? Maybe we can, we can actually uh, share the efforts of the most part of the group of re-engineering and language design and we can uh, continue um, to choose one system and actually improve it. And uh, one big thing that we wanted to do is to not do a big thing. So we didn't want to say, ah, we go in seclusion for two years and then we will come back with the best ever programming language invented. The idea was to just um, take the thing that we use every day and improve it step by step and even improve it in a way that we know is not what is the perfect thing because perfection is often too expensive or there is no time and sometimes it's clear we use first this imperfection then the next imperfection and the third iteration might be good it often works quite nicely that way and um, another thing that we wanted to do is to um, by improving things uh, bringing a kind of a, a loop into the system so if you if you improve a, a system that is a development environment then that means that you can develop faster and if you develop your development environment then that means that every improvement kind of gets into a feedback loop so that you can uh, improve the system and because you improved it you can improve it easier in the next iteration this is actually already you can actually already see that this really trivial things so there are there were lots of uh, 
cases in Squeak back then that people said, oh, there is a typo in a comment, or the comment is wrong and they rewrote it, and people ignored it. it uh, and uh, the question is always, yeah, you can say, yeah, that's trivial, nobody needs that, we need to do the big things and not the trivial things. But the problem is that this uh, has a cost, because the next person that will look at the code will spend maybe only five minutes to think, why is this variable there until he realizes that variable is not referenced, or there's a typo in a comment, or the comment is outdated, or things like that. So even small improvements have an effect, because if you fix them, the next person looking at the code will be five minutes more effective. And a big uh, thing that you can see is if you have a tool like a, a refactoring browser. So the refactoring browser um, is, a, is a browser that contains a meta model of the code, and allows you to, to change code very easily. So you can do uh, things like renaming methods without by hand changing all uh, senders of the method. And, and the change like that is directly beneficial for the system because if you have a uh, something like that, then you can improve the system faster. So it has a direct uh, feedback. And you can even use it to improve the tool itself. So even if you say, yeah, refactoring browser, that's not the best possible refactoring browser ever, and if I would have six months of full-time work to make a better one, it would be 20 times better. Yes, but just by being there, you can use itself to improve itself and use it, use it to improve the system, and you have a very nice effect that uh, you would just not have if you don't use it. Even so, it might not be the perfect solution. So... Yeah, in, in the end it was just, we are using this, this system, which was in that case Greek since 10 years. It might well be that we will use it in 10 years again, especially after moving the whole Moose stuff over. Uh, why don't we just make it better than it is now? This does not include any big vision of the best programming language ever or something like this. It's just plain down to the earth. There is a typo, we fix it. There is a dead code, why don't we remove it? Very simple. And the overall idea coming from both business, uh, teaching, and research was to have kind of two things. One thing is we want a flexible environment to uh, research about innovation, even so the system itself is not that innovation yet. I mean, it's just a small talk system. We want it to be flexible so that we can do research with it easier. I mean, we have yeah, 10 years of research in programming language, and there are a lot of things that would make this much, much easier if we would just take what we did, what, what the student did then, and redo it in a nice way. For example, the compiler in, in, in the original Smalltalk system is really hard to understand, which is not a problem if you just use it. But if you are a student that wants to change something, if you spend one month of understanding code that uses patterns that were nowhere, nowhere documented, that makes no sense. Um, so, innovation as a basis for research. The other thing was that as we were involved in consulting, or people had startups that used uh, Squeak back then, the idea was, what, what, can we, what do we need there? And there the, the thing was, yeah, it should be actually usable for business. So it should be stable. It should not be full of bugs. It should have a stable release and an unstable release. And it should just work, which would be nice. And the question now is, isn't that a conflict? I mean, that's the first idea. Hmm. Robustness for industry innovation that's a direct clash and they cannot and never will be together. So, and, and the thing is that actually uh, we, we think that this is not uh, a direct clash. So, um, one way of, of looking at research is uh, to uh, imagine that you are exploring an unknown space with a big mountain in the middle. And, and the idea is that you, you don't know anything. Maybe, the, I mean, the mountain is in clouds and you don't know how high it is and where to go. You only know that you want to go as high as possible and that there will be very, very nice things uh, there. So the question is, what do you do in, in a situation when this would be a real mountain expedition? And there people actually um, know that it is better to invest into building a base camp somewhere in, in the middle. So you do not go from the, from the lowest end to the top, uh, because that's your goal. But instead, you actually invest into bringing up stuff onto a middle level, building uh, some better tents so that you can actually sleep well, and then when you are rested, you can continue. And this, is, this should be like that in research, too. So the idea is you should not um, say, I'm doing research, 
So I always start from the uh, blank sheet and I never uh, refactor my code because we just go to the mountain, to the top, and when we don't reach it, we start again from the, from the bottom. That cannot work in the end. Especially if you, if you think about that the systems that we build get bigger and bigger. So in the, in the 70s when Smalltalk was invented, it was kind of easy to, to say, ah, let's uh, start with a blank sheet of paper and within two years we build a system, we learn from it, then we throw it away and we start again. That was perfectly possible and that was actually how Smalltalk was invented. I mean, they did multiple iterations and they were all kind of starting from scratch. So Smalltalk 72, Smalltalk 76, but even then, when Smalltalk, I think 76, was finished, it was already too big to just throw everything away and redo it because it's really boring to redo stuff that you are not interested in, file handling or graph uh, reading uh, graphics files or whatever, all these basic things. So what they developed, that they actually, instead of starting from scratch, they actually uh, evolved the system to start with a system that's already there and evolve it gradually into the next one. And that is a bit what, 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 um, what one should do when one uh, wants to reach the mountain. One, one first goes here, learns about the space, can look at, at, at everything, and then continue to climb up well rested and with a lot of more information. And so from that point of view, we actually don't think that having a system for business being that incompatible with research, because the base camp is where both meet. So the base camp is something that both uh, industry and, and research actually share. Uh, another thing is that, um, very practical, if, if, a, if a student, maybe master student or especially PhD student comes and says, I want to work with you for three or four years with a bad salary, then it, I think that we, we, we are supposed to give them something that is usable. So where we say, you can use this, and it works, and not we, you can use this, and it is somehow crappy, and uh, fix the bugs yourself, and we don't care. So, from that point of view, we actually think that, that both uh, views of, of the whole thing are very much in, in, uh, in sync. Research is an expedition, and we need a stable base. Business needs a stable base to serve the customer, and both can use actually the same thing. So, the question is, is that possible? And the funny thing is that actually we, we have now both kinds of people in the community. So Favo started, I think, around two years ago with the first release this year and already a second one. I will explain that later a bit. And we already have quite some people. We have in research and teaching, we have uh, multiple universities using it for teaching. We have multiple universi universities and research institutions using it for research. Um, and we have quite some companies in the meantime that uh, are involved or use the system in some way. So all these are from the, from the website, so if you use it, you normally can register yourself and say, yeah, I'm using it, and so that uh, people kind of get the impression how, it is, uh, how the system is already uh, useful for, for people, and this is just a copy from the website. So if uh, you are missing, then this is the case. And this is actually, I tried to go through everything and I'm sure I missed half of it, all the um, Argentinian and uh, Chilean uh, participations, which is interesting if you think about it, that uh, both from a, a research teaching and uh, business perspective, there are a lot of uh, companies here that, that use the, the system, which is very nice. So the goal is to have an ecosystem of small companies and of researchers and of students where we can actually build something that is, that is useful. And um, besides names, I want to actually show a bit uh, examples where, where this is used. So the biggest use case that, that we have in the real world is, I guess, Seaside. So the Seaside uh, maintainers actually uh, used to use uh, Squeak for development and when Faro 1.0 was released, they switched uh, over to, to Faro instead. And so the, the thing that you download now mostly is, uh, is based on that. And it, it, um, it's nice. So the, the user interface is far more tailored towards standard development than, than Squeak. And so people that now come into the Seaside have a very much 
uh, easier time to get started and to understand what you can do and things like that. And there are actually examples of real um, small companies that use this as their main uh, development platform. One very interesting project is uh, one uh, which is called Next Plan by In Inceptive. This is a very, um, how to say, a very extensive CSET application with a database backend and a very dynamic front end for planning events. So this was developed together with a uh, this uh, institution in um, in Belgium that needs to organize hundreds of events per year and they needed a good software for doing that. And uh, the company used uh, Seaside and, and Faro to, to develop it and um, I think deploy it in the meantime maybe on, on Gemstone, which I will later describe. Another uh, thing is uh, CMS Box and this is kind of the f first a uh, commercial user of Faro in some sense because one of the uh, founders of that com company, Adrian Lienhardt, is actually was one of the people starting uh, Faro. And that was interesting because um, he, uh, did a, he was at the same time doing a PhD in Bern and uh, uh, developing this and he directly said, yes, this is what, what, we need, what we need. We need to invest into the system. We cannot forever continue to not do that. Um, another interesting commercial uh, player is Pinesoft and they actually um, developed the user interface that, that we use. It's, a, um, an, it's a, an addition on top of Morphic which provides uh, multiple look and feels. It's not the most um, modular change to Morphic because it, its main goal was to solve a problem and the problem was to be able to make uh, applications that are presentable to customers in a way that you can actually change the look and feel easy, uh, easy, very easily. So it has a look and feel that looks like this and then it has a look and feel that looks like Windows uh, 95 and things like that and you can with that easily um, deploy your application when the looks should look professional. Another interesting player in the whole community is um, Gemstone. Uh, Gemstone is a, is a database originally, so the, uh, they, in the 80s they started to build an object database and interestingly they added a scripting language inside which is Smalltalk. So in the end it's a Smalltalk system that is just persistent. So your image can be bigger than memory and can sp uh, spread over multiple machines. Extremely powerful, very nice and Gemstone always was, was uh, an object database and you used it in combination with other Smalltalk systems or even with Java. Um, and they actually took um, Faro and built um, a system where Faro is the development environment um, for building web applications with Gemstone. So you use Faro to build program stuff and when you say, okay, this is stable, I will now want to play a bit on the real server, then you can actually deploy uh, your application on uh, Gemstone. Gemstone has for that a, a small layer that makes it more compatible with Faro, uh, but nevertheless it's, it's a port. So when you finish, when, when you develop in, in, in Faro, you need to always uh, be sure that you do not use stuff that is not available in Gemstone. But a very, very interesting and especially a very interesting uh, thing to scale up applications. So if you start uh, developing CSET applications, you use the free tools, and when you then get more customers and you need to scale up, you can use Gemstone up to, I think, 16 gigabytes of database size for free and afterwards you can, I'm sure you will be glad to pay <laughs> when you have the problem of more than 16 gigabytes of data. So besides of um, business, there is of course the research aspect. And um, one thing we actually saw this morning, so uh, Lucas uh, did his PhD in Bern in the group where um, yeah, most of the people that, that started Faro were, were working. And he um, used, used Faro for this. And this kind of shows uh, why, why we want, um, or what we want to do. So we want to provide a system where, where, where the research aspect can be done easy, easily, and where later we actually can even feed back things. I mean, there are many, many, many things in in Helvetia that actually would make sense to have in the system by default. I would 
outside of, of a research prototype. For example, uh, the Petty Parser framework is, is very nice, very powerful, and um, it would be interesting to evaluate could it replace the current parser to make it easy reusable, or uh, would it make sense in addition as a tool directly in the system because it is. It's so easy to, to use that you can actually build parsers like you now use regular expressions, which is extremely powerful. Another research uh, thing is the Moose uh, system. That is the system for doing um, re-engineering and vi uh, software visualizations. I have even a picture of that. And here, um, the idea is that it's a complete framework for uh, analyzing code, so it has meta models of code, not only uh, small talk because it's a general uh, software visualization tool, so you can read uh, C and C++ and Java, and then you can uh, visualize uh, the system. And here it's, it's imp here it's actually important to have a stable base system because people developing Moose are not interested in an experimental small talk system where there are some strange cool features. They want to have something that they can uh, rely on and they always use the stable release and not uh, the development release. So, how much time do I have in addition? Yeah. Hmm? 25. 25 minutes. Okay. So, um, what I want to do now is to explain a bit more and, and what we actually did already uh, with FAO. So the first release was in May, I think I have even a slide for that. But it, it goes actually already two years uh, back, so the first release had a lot of changes. So we started actually uh, in 2008 uh, with Squeak 3.9, that was the Squeak release that we uh, managed, and uh, applied some major cleanups to it. So one thing that we removed is the old MVC framework, which was uh, mostly important uh, for having um, a system to fall back and onto uh, if, if you would do morphic or would, if you would wanted to do grave morphic changes but that can be solved in other ways and we have a solution for that so we actually removed the old MVC framework from, from the system and this simplified a lot because all tools were kept compatible with both uh, morphic and uh, MVC even so, there was is a, a layer in between. Um, there was a lot of code that was uh, specific for MVC, and the, the funny thing was that it was always broken because nobody used it. So in 3.9, you could not use it, and we never got anyone to fix it because it's really not used anymore. So we removed that. We removed eToys, which was very sad because I'm a huge eToy fan. But um, in 3.9, we, we actually put a lot of effort into eToys. So there was a big project in Spain. There's 50,000 uh, machines where ETOS was installed, and where um, uh, Diego did a lot of uh, improvements. And we actually coordinated with him, like, oh, can you in two months? And then we block everything for a couple of weeks, and then we integrate the changes. And it was uh, quite some work, uh, and nobody cared. I mean, it was never ever used by any child, and the uh, eToy development was done on a separate path, and so it made no sense. I mean, it would not have been used. So, and the the problem is that ETOS is not modular in any way, so it really has a huge impact on the system. In the end, the question is, I mean, if it's really so important, and that is something that we should ask ourselves or everyone who is kind of in, involved or interested, if it's really that important, why is it so bad? That's a good question. Um, yeah, and we, we added the new look because we wanted to have something that is presentable, uh, true type, uh, fonts, Lots of tools, so the idea is to have uh, a core release with simple tools and a full release with um, omni-browser and uh, refactoring tools, which work very nicely. Uh, we added the block closures that Elliot did at uh, Teleplace, and we added a lot of improvements. And um, a lot means a lot. So, I, so this is, I, I looked through the bug tracker, and we had 1,200 bug reports closed for 1.0. And uh, 470 updates, so every update has a couple of, of changes in it. Uh, and um, it took some effort, especially getting it stable at the end, so we had some, quite some better phase to make it really, really stable. Nevertheless, in parallel, we always continued already. And so 1.1, which was mostly a performance uh, release um, and further cleanup, uh, was released quite quickly afterwards. So. Um, 
July 26, so just a, what is that, two months later, we uh, had 1.1 finished. An additional 800 uh, or nearly 900 bug reports treated. Um, and the 1.1 is actually quite nice. So it's much faster than 1.0 and really uh, nicely usable, I think. And um, now we actually continue. So the release was in, in July and we continue to do things. And uh, the version 1.2 is supposed to be uh, in code freeze end of November. And uh, it's already saw a lot of change. Um, it's again a, a minor release. That means it continues to remove that code, uh, reflect or some things, uh, add small improvements. So everything that people see uh, is, is, is fixed. So especially, uh, uh, yes? Um, already version 1.1, or the, the, there is a minor release 1.1.1. That one can run on Coq. Version 1.2, quite likely, yes. So 1.1.1, uh, I think we have not yet updated the, the downloads, the one-click downloads, but the idea was to provide two, and um, one for Coq, one not. And 1.2 we will see. Uh, maybe, yes, we will, we will. I think people that actually use 1.1.1 to some extent already. I think Moose, oops, Moose uses uh, Coq exclusively already. Uh, Lucas is using Coq for everything, so for CSAT development. And so, yeah, it's very likely that we will do that. And um, the question now is what will happen in the future? And um, the other the, the important thing is the future is what we do. The thing is always that it's easy to make big plans and yeah, we will have that and that, but it needs to be done. And in an open source effort, that is always something that is uh, very hard to, to say, we will do that now. Um, and the we means the community, not the people that, that started with it. Um, one thing in the future that will be interesting is, um, I explained a lot that stable release is important, and uh, even for research we need that. But the other aspect of the whole story is that we nevertheless want to move forward. So something that Elad uh, always tries to explain to people is it makes no sense to, to just have a small talk system because it's 30 years old and the world needs something else. So the challenge that we will have is, especially for the major releases 2.0, is to the question of how can we support to evolve the system in a, in a meaningful way that goes beyond small iterations or small changes. The iteration should be small, but the changes should add up to be something big. And there are actually two uh, parts of that problem. One is, how can we support the evolution of applications? That is something that everyone wants to have. That if I improve m m my application, it's always a problem to, uh, to do that. Um, especially, how do I evolve applications when the base system changes? That is already between the minor releases we explicitly say we are not backward compatible uh, for being backward compatible. So there is some uh, care to deprecate things, to make some way of going forward, but we will not keep infrastructure just to be compatible. One example are the preferences. So it used to be that there was one big global preference class that was referenced thousands of times in the system, which was now replaced by a, an infrastructure that does not require that. And the idea is that the preferences will be gone, so we will not keep a compatibility layer for preferences to load old code. At least not longer than one iteration. So that is one, one challenge, and the other challenge is how do we support the evolution of the system itself? So how do we make this a better small talk, or how do we go beyond small talk? And that is actually a, a good question. I think it's actually a research question, not an engineering question. If you look at, at uh, the history, then there is no programming language that was designed with evolution in mind. So people that develop programming languages are, more, are mostly people that like the waterfall model, or that think that the waterfall model is how, how it works. So the, the programming languages themselves have no support for, for, for uh, evolution. It's always the tools. So people say, yeah, that's not programming language, that is tools. Just use the right tools, and that's not our problem. But I think that is actually not the case. I think that the programming language needs to support uh, 
software evolution. Once the evolution of programming languages, but on the other hand, the evolution of itself. And that is actually a, a good research question, and there is no uh, single answer to that. How do we build a, lang a language that supports evolution of both the uh, programs written with it and uh, the system itself? But um, having questions where you don't know the answer directly is always interesting as a, as a kind of a, a starting point for the research side of things. And as soon as we learn how to do it, we can actually feed it back into the system uh, from an engineering standpoint. And if you look at uh, Faro or small talk in general, then there are some good foundations uh, that one should explore for um, moving in that direction. And I'm working it's a very dynamic language, so we can actually change a lot of things because they are not hard-coded. So it's mostly written in itself. There is a lot of reflective capabilities in the system. Um, we have metaprogramming often outside of the language. That's an example. I mean, a refactoring browser is not part of the language. It's a tool. Um, the development environment is implemented in itself. All these things. So there are actually a lot of uh, things already there that I think will, it, will make it easy to, or easier to explore this direction. Um, another thing is, on the level of the community, of the people that actually use it for whatever research uh, or um, using it for real stuff, uh, one thing is, is important is that everyone can, can help. So we actually do have a bug tracker and um, we actually look at it. So if people uh, report something, it will actually be looked at. does not mean that everything gets fixed because Everything takes time, but if you uh, find something and fix it, then the, uh, um, it is quite likely that, that it actually will be added, especially if it's uh, well documented and uh, well done. And it, it's really the small stuff that, that already uh, helps a lot. So the bug, track, the bug trackers always have the tendency of uh, growing a lot and just looking at bug reports and saying, yeah, I cannot, uh, in the new release it, it works. It's already a, a huge uh, contribution because that means we can close the button. So everyone can help and uh, is invited to do so. If you want to start, there is a book, Faro by Example, which is based on, on the Squeak by Example book, updated for the, la uh, for the first uh, release. So it's for 1.0, which means it's already outdated. <laughs> but uh, if, you, uh, if people want to learn it, there is actually an image uh, specially prepared for the book and one can do all the examples. At some point in the future we have to update the book, but I think that this will have to wait to 2.0. Another thing that we do is uh, that we meet to work together, um, which is quite nice. So the idea is there is that just everyone that is interested in learning something or doing something uh, is invited to come. Uh, we meet somewhere, mostly at, at the university, um, for a day or shorter, so as a sprint uh, yesterday was a bit too short, it was just uh, three hours, I think. The idea there is that you just, that every, everyone who uses it sits together and, and improves the system. It's quite nice, so that means that students can work with the old professor or the um, professional guy can work with a researcher and everyone learns. It's quite nice. Um, yeah. I should not forget to thank everyone that uh, added something to the system. Thankfully the font is so small that you will not see that we didn't update it for some months. <laughs> yeah, that's it. If you have any questions. First, I want to thank you. That's a good question. We do not really count. We should actually do that. We should keep some statistics. I would guess that we have 20 people that actively contribute. Because having that information and looking at how it evolved, yeah. I think it's very important. Right, yeah. Because uh, you can measure what things through your poll participation or Yes. About 20. I think 20 people do, do a lot and um, 
Yeah, and, and I mean, everyone on, on this list contributed something. Mm -hmm. And that is a lot of people. And some of the things, I mean, even if people do not contribute regularly and are not part of the 20 people, that can be something really big and important. So it's, it's difficult to tell. We should actually uh, start to, to do better statistics. Yeah? Uh, one of the issues with uh, maintaining a uh, distribution is uh, really uh, having at least some shared vision and direction in which you want to take the system. And so, uh, do you have some, some group of people that also try to keep uh, the efforts focused or moving it or Because you have otherwise around the danger if everybody just starts sticking different pieces of yes, the system, sir. it's just going to be. Uh, in all possible directions. And so one thing that we did differently to Squeak is mm -hmm. that there is a board of people, so we are four right now, so that um, actually kind of have the power to, to take decisions if, the, if decisions are not taken. And yeah, and with that one can actually, uh, I hope, um, lessen the, the problem a bit. So, so the board generally so what what we do is actually that um, we we have a model that is not completely open to commit into the main release. So the thing is that everything work, uh, works with a bug tracker. So everyone can commit to the inbox, but needs to put some note on the bug tracker, and then in the second step, um, someone from the, from the core team looks at these submissions and thinks again: Does this make sense or not? Um, this has positive and negative effects. The negative effect is that it does not feel as uh, direct as committing uh, on a C source code on SVN. Uh, for example, so which is a, can be a problem because it can feel a bit indirect. But the good thing is that we can with that really control what happens. So we can say, yeah, that could be cool for an experimental system, but maybe not for this system, for example. So from that point of view, so that's actually, I think, quite a good model because that way you, a fire sprint can happen really anywhere. It doesn't really need to have someone right. who's really involved in the core, you know, maybe not the other before, but from the core 20, let's say. Yes. It doesn't really need to be there. People, if they feel like, you know, trying something maybe for the reason of getting more familiar with the system and at the same time maybe fixing a few bugs, uh, it's still quite fine, you submit it to the issue tracker and either gets in or not, right? Right. Okay. And, um, yeah, so for, we had, for example, in the past uh, sprints where at the sprint everyone really worked on, on issues and someone who was not there did the integration at the sites and always really, yeah, just looked at everything again and was thinking instead of small. I mean, many things are really small. And people could argue trivial and unimportant, but and, and, and they can be added very quickly. And uh, bigger things then can be discussed and un analyzed in deep in depth. Oh. Okay.